MWA wants to um, thank all of its sponsors here today, especially the New York, New Jersey Harbor Coalition as, and the Coalition of Nonprofits. The main ingredient uh, missing from most plans is money, and the Harbor Coalition is working to secure the federal money needed to match local support. Please check out their booth at the front and in the main hall. So basically, we'd love for you to check out everybody booths, everybody's booth that is here, that is out in the front, as well as in the main hall. We have a lot of interesting sponsors here, including um, Sims Metal Management, which is a dear friend of mine. I'm, my name's Helena Durst, um, and I travel over a lot of different areas in New York City. Um, a lot of people are familiar with my last name, the Durst Organization. We own about 10 million square feet of commercial and residential property. And about 10 years ago, we invested in New York Water Taxi, and through that also invested in Circle Line downtown. The first question I get is, why did you guys invest in boats? And the answer is really si uh, simple, and it's about quality of life. New York City is my bread and butter. It's my blood, really. And quality of life is essential. And as New York has grown and gotten bigger, what we've been losing out is places to recreate. And the next pl great place to recreate is the harbor. And what we want to talk about today is the multiplier effect that the harbor has on job creation as well as destinations. What my experience has been through New York Water Taxi and Circle Line downtown is you're always creating your new destination. You're always creating a reason for people to go out. Of course, we have the Statue of Liberty. We have Liberty. Uh, we have Ellis Island. We have all these great destinations that people always think about when they think about the New York Harbor. But as, as boat owners, we all need to be thinking about boat owners as well as um, public and nonprofit agencies. We need to be thinking about how can we be creating the next destination. A great example of this was the waterfalls a couple years ago. It's huge for a lot of the people who are running the boats. And this is not just the big guys that, that are here today, like New York Waterway, New York Water Taxi, Hornblower, but it's also for the small guys out there, the people who own maybe one or two boats that take people out on tours a couple times a week. Because it's a huge economic engine to be able to have small boat owners, small small businesses out on the water. People love, people who have these boats, people who are captains, have the most dedication you've ever seen to the New York Harbor. And this is great, again, for New York City, because it's an economic engine. It's a way to draw people to New York. It's a way to draw tourists to New York, but it's also a way to keep dollars in New York and a way to find New Yorkers to recreate on our harbor. Where else can you get fresh air? Can you get exercise if you're willing to get into a kayak or to go rowing? Um, it's also a great place to get sun. All of the same things that you would find in a fantastic park. And as New York has been developing its waterfront, it has been developing its parks. And all of this is extremely important. It's a crucial part of the key in what we've all been talking about today and how to make New York a better place. So, I'm going to introduce, let me tell you a little bit about how we're going to be going through our presentation today. We have four fantastic panelists. I'm going to introduce each of the panelists, and they're going to go through their own presentation. Um, I'm going to try to be very short on the bios. Of course, everybody can read the individual bios um, as, as they come, but let me just give you a little bit of a flavor for each of the, the individuals that are coming up today and, and what they're going to be talking about. Our first talker today is Terry McRee. Did I say that right? McRae. McRae, sorry. CEO of Statue Cruises as well as Hornblower. Um, many of you should be familiar with Statue Cruises. Statue Cruises is taking the, the uh, passengers out to uh, Statue of Liberty as well as I Ellis Island. They are a little bit of a, a newcomer, as it were, into the, into the boat industry coming into the harbor about five years ago. Um, they were coming out from San Francisco, running off of a very, very popular um, industry created out of Alcatraz. And what we, I would like to try to focus on today is the similarities that we can see in a lot of the other harbors throughout the United States, including San Francisco, San Francisco and Chicago. And we're very, uh, we have the great pleasure and honor to have both Terry and Marie in the, same co in the same room on the same panel where we can be talking about the successes of San Francisco and the San Francisco Bay and what they've done there and what we can be replicating in New York City. So, Terry, I'm going to hand it over to you.
Helena, thank you very much. Uh, let's see if we can pull up here. So I think the theme could just as well be an environmental resource and an economic engine. I like the way those things can be pretty interchangeable, but it's great to be here today. Um, just a, a sort of a quick summary about our business. We operate over 100 passenger vessels in uh, uh, different countries and different cities. Uh, I think we, we've, I probably carried 65 million passengers, and we're doing about 12 million passenger trips a year. Um, I think, uh, let's see if I can figure out there, that would be forward. So this is a quick summary of the things that I want to talk about. I want to do this sort of MTV style, there will be someone I blast through fairly quickly. I think the uh, connecting to the waterfront f for, uh, for me is, uh, let's see, have to figure out if we, left right, do I point it at you? Sorry about that. There we go. Uh, I think these are the, the seven different things that are necessary. And of course, you heard a little bit from Ken Jackson about the harbor and the way it used to be. And there's certainly every opportunity to uh, return this way. Uh, San Francisco is a perfect example of this. We used to carry 20 million passengers a year on San Francisco Bay in the ferry business. And now we're, of course, way less than that. But there uh, have to be these critical activities necessary to connect people to the waterfront. Uh, planning, policy, resolve. You can do all the planning and all the policy and, and lose it from there because you're not committed. Certainly the funding, uh, the facilities, the programming, once you have those facilities. And I think one of the more important things is the, is the promotional aspects of it, how you, um, you know, make that uh, um, happen uh, going forward. So I'm not real sure why I'm having such difficulty with this. you have another, another plan for me here? Okay, that's all right. So um, maybe I'll just say next slide and you can do that for me. Thank you. Sorry about that. Um, huge opportunities uh, to create a tourist destination here as there is in many beautiful harbors around the world. Uh, Sydney Harbor, San Francisco Harbor, Seattle Harbor. Um, and I look at this market as something like $50 million in the dining cruise business and maybe $75 million in the sightseeing business. Uh, those translate into a lot of capital spending. They translate in a lot of rents paid. They translate into a lot of jobs. And really, when you have iconic products, as you do here, the Statue of Liberty, the Verrazano, the, San Francisco, or the uh, New York Skyline, the Battery Park, you have all these fabulous uh, icons here. Those are the things that can be uh, promoted. And frankly, uh, promoting them is really not a government forte. That's the government is not into the marketing and promotion side of it, and that's a private sector opportunity. There's both B2B marketing opportunities, that gets locals in, and there's also uh, business to consumer marketing. You, you don't have just one or the other, which is a great thing about it. Hospitality services produce visitation, whether it's the hot dog cart in the park or whether it's uh, you know, an elegant dinner cruise, whether it's entertainment. Uh, the sightseeing and the packaging are great traffic generators in terms of bringing people to the waterfront. Many people, when they choose to come to an area, they make their activities plans first, and then they make their hotel plans and their airplane reservations. So those activities are really critical. Of course, do no harm is a critical element. Uh, it doesn't make any sense to have all this great activity and then uh, uh, not take care of it. Hybrid technology, which I'll touch on, is a, is a great opportunity to do that. And personally, we like the entrepreneurial, an entrepreneurial approach. Uh, healthy competition is, is also good for that. So, I think on the next slide, I have an overview. Most of you have seen, of course, uh, the city skyline and uh, Battery Park, where we operate uh, the, the departures to the Statue of Liberty. That service carries about uh, 4 million people a year, a little under that. Uh, next slide. So I have just a couple of research results that might be of interest to you here. On the left side, it shows the mode of transportation that people use to arrive at the waterfront in order to uh, take a ferry uh, trip to, to uh, Liberty. 52% um, subway, 20% um, personal car, and this is blended for both Battery and New Jersey. So obviously New Jersey has more car arrivals and New York would have more subway arrivals. This is not a small sample, it's almost 20,000 people, so there's some good validity here. Uh, first visit, 67%, it's the first visit. Uh, it's great, at least 33% of the people are coming back again. And then I thought interesting also, in uh, some people it's more than 10 years since they've been back to the same visit. So. Uh, next slide, please. So one of the things that makes a harbor world class is having some great attractions. Uh, in our particular case, we like to say we create amazing experiences, and we do that through a lot of different brands, whether it's a, a water taxi in Marina del Rey or a cafe 
or a historic building in San Diego. Um, it's all about having a good brand and a good brand approach. Um, next slide, please. So we're uh, splashing into New York Harbor, as we say here, uh, with uh, some, some new brands and some new opportunities. Um, I think there's two or three of the boats shown there. And, and I think in our case, we're using some very innovative bo boats to help us get going. Next slide, please. This is some of the marketing stuff that we'll be doing. You'll see some of that coming up. And the next slide shows some of the different operating locations. Uh, oddly enough, in, in most of the operating locations on the top, we have uh, uh, public landlords. Uh, we have uh, National Park Service as one of our landlords. We have uh, New York Parks and Rec as one of our landlords. EDC is one of our landlords. Hudson River uh, Trust is one of our landlords. Uh, New Jersey Department of Environmental Protection is one of our landlords. Um, next slide, please. So this is a preview of coming attractions. As you know, EDC has developed Pier 15. We're successful in, in winning that competition and uh, hope to start service this year when, when some of the improvements are made. Next slide. The environmental uh, resource and the environmental protection is critical. Uh, this is one of the ways we've gone about doing this. As part of our responsibility to the National Park Service, we have uh, created a, a low emission uh, and even zero emission at, at, at some times a vessel that's coming here to New York. You may have seen this vessel floating around. Uh, it's got uh, an amazing profile, amazing lighting. Uh, it's going to be a lot of fun. I think the next slide shows a few other uh, elements and features of it. It'll also be available for charter. And of course, this is the vessel that will be uh, available tonight for those of you that we hope will, will join us. Uh, next slide, please. Tough to build um, around a single vessel, so we also have a, a second uh, vessel that, uh, in fact, arrived at 5 a.m. this morning. How fortuitous. So this is the Hornblower Infinity. It'll be a 1,000 passenger plus vessel that has uh, seven different entertainment spaces. And the next slide will show um, you know, how this helps uh, drive new products in the marketplace. New equipment, new capital investment creates new jobs, new products, new energy for people to come down to the waterfront. Just the, the next slide is a quick discussion about hybrid vessels. Uh, the vessel that you're riding on tonight has multiple sources of power. Uh, it has uh, micro turbines, it has solar power, it has uh, electric uh, motors and electric uh, uh, battery storage on board. Uh, it also has diesel fuel because it's very difficult to store enough fuel in those other forms to, uh, to uh, push a big boat around the harbor like this. It will also have hydrogen fuel cells at some point in time. You can imagine the uh, challenge of, uh, of uh, bringing hydrogen uh, fuel cells here when you have the city not wanting to see uh, hydrogen in the tunnels and you have uh, people that can think back to when the Hindenburg uh, blew up in New York City. So it's, uh, it's a little longer process. I think the next slide is a little bit of a discussion about uh, San Francisco and some of our experience there. It's titled, What Were They Thinking? Because it's not necessarily about all the good stuff we're doing there, but some of the stuff that we have to think twice about. You know, we had a beautiful waterway there, and we built a three-deck freeway between the city and the water. And it took Mother Nature coming along in 1989 in the form of the Loma Prieta earthquake to knock that freeway down and reclaim the waterfront for the people. It's beautiful and it's amazing. It's really uh, spectacular. Mm -hmm. We also have no a, a water transit authority there that became, after 9-11, they decided uh, to, to consider the water uh, emergency transit authority. We added the word emergency in there to build a greater sense of opportunity for funding, as a matter of fact. So sadly enough, while they've done some really great things, they've also probably spent about $150 million. And just last week, they announced the startup of their first route after almost 12 or 14 years of planning and spending $150 million. Uh, I mean, we're spending $25 million on terminals that are going to handle hundreds of people a day. Um, great opportunities there for some new ferry routes. But boy, uh, in my view, private sector could have taken that $150 million and added uh, so many different things so quickly compared to how long it's taken to get where we are now. And then, of course, the funding for the government, our state's running at about a $16 billion deficit. So they're going to find it tough to fund much more ferry activity. New York Harbor has uh, some, some similar opportunities. Uh, my view here. Uh, biggest uh, planning mistake uh, of the last hundred years in both San Francisco and here is not putting the water connections, excuse me, the water connections and the land connections together. Mm. Only one place here where the subways uh, hook up with the water and that's at Battery Park. That's at the Staten Island Ferry Terminal. Um, some of the ferry operators have made that connection with buses, but frankly the, the transit uh, should be integrated there. Uh, and of course we think people should pay to ride boats, so we're not real 
uh, happy that uh, the Staten Island Ferry is subsidized. We understand the benefit of it. And of course, we always think locals should have a better opportunity. Um, I'll just wrap up with these uh, three uh, different points here. The economic, uh, transportation, and environmental uh, issues are all critical to produce this waterfront connection. Um, whether it's uh, you know sightseeing cruises and ferry operations driving the economic part, whether it's uh, quality of life associated, uh, as Helena said, with uh, providing uh, good transportation on the water. Um, each of these three elements are important to produce this waterfront connection. And then lastly, I have my top ten reasons to promote the New York waterfront. Uh, magic happens at water's edge. People need water to live. Uh, may not be possible in the future. We've found that in a number of places as the land uh, comes down and meets the water. You can't actually do anything there in the future. Uh, kids love it. Uh, tourists uh, bring money into the economy. Uh, it's good for locals and tourists alike right down to, in my view, New York already has a world-class harbor. This isn't about, oh, we have to go make one. There's one here already. It's amazing. Uh, it's such a huge opportunity for everybody, uh, and we're happy to be part of it and be looking forward to any questions that you have later on. Thank you. Um, again, I just want to remind everybody we're going through each of the panelists and then following uh, each of the panelists' presentation, we're going to have a chance to ask questions. I, I see uh, cards being handed out right now, so make sure you get one of those cards and write out your question, and then they'll be uh, filtered up to me, and we'll try to get to as many as possible. Our next speaker we're very lucky to have is Maria Burks, Commissioner of National Parks for New York Harbor. Um, I just have to mention that her bio is so short, but we all know that her job is very long and she has many, many different responsibilities. Um, again, what makes New York such an interesting, New York City and New York Harbor such an interesting place is because we've had, we have such a long history here, starting with Verrazano visiting um, New York, going down to Henry Hudson and then all the way down the line. And Maria has been left with the responsibility of um, being the steward of all of the national parks that are now in the New York Harbor. So, Maria, please come up. Well, good morning, everyone. Thank you, Helena, very much for that introduction. I'm delighted to tell you about the National Parks of New York Harbor. Um, I bet you can't name them, or you think you can't but you're going to be surprised at how many of our destinations you're going to recognize. Um, most of you know about the Statue of Liberty in Ellis Island, but um, can you put my cover slide up? Yeah. But uh, you may not know that we have nine other special places in and around New York Harbor that were designated either through presidential proclamation or an act of Congress as being nationally significant, part of our nation's story and our nation's history. Let's see if I can make this. There we go. Oops. Preview of coming attractions there. Um, so, uh, it, ooh, hang on one second. I need my pointer. You can visit our, as you visit our parks, all of our 22 recognizable destinations, you can stand in the Federal Hall National Memorial, which is where the presidency was created. George Washington took the oath of office for the first time as our president. You can visit homes and tombs where some of our early citizens, some of them extremely prominent, some of them not so, lived or now lie, the only home that Alexander Hamilton ever owned, the mausoleum where President Grant and his wife are now um, entombed, not buried, there's no one buried in Grant's tomb. The place where Theodore Roosevelt was born, the place where a variety of immigrants, um, the Lower East Side Tenement Museum where thousands of immigrants moved and lived after they moved here, and the African, uh, I'm sorry, that's here, and the African Burial Ground National Monument where 10 to 20,000 free or enslaved Africans were buried and were forgotten for almost 200 years. You can glimpse the way we learned lessons during the American Revolution. St. Paul's National Historic Site is just up okay. off the boundary in Westchester County, but it's uh, Westchester County, but it's where a Revolutionary War battle happened. Uh, lessons were learned there that were pretty tough lessons, and as a result, there were a series of fortifications built around the harbor at Castle Clinton. The base of the Statue of Liberty is actually Fort Wood. For those of you who can see, it's a star-shaped fort. There are two forts on Governor's Island, um, Castle Williams and Fort Jay, that we're in the process of restoring. And then during the Civil War, fortifications moved out into the Outer Harbor, and right at the Narrows, we have uh, Fort Hamilton, which is still operated by the military, but is the companion fort to Fort Wadsworth, built to protect the Inner Harbor from the threat of invasion during the Civil War. 
And then during the Cold War era, fortifications at Fort Wadsworth, further out at Fort Tilden, and out at Fort Hancock at Sandy Hook were built. These are all National Park Service areas, and I bet you know them by name, but you might not have known they were parts of national parks. When you visit our parks, you can explore the waters of, the, of New York Harbor and the estuary, the salt marshes of Jamaica Bay. This is an area here that is literally 10 times the size of Central Park, the largest open park space anywhere in New York City. You can visit the dunes and the beaches at Reese and along Fort Tilden and at Sandy Hook. And we have marinas over at Great Kills and a swimming beach at Great Kills, a marina over at Jamaica Bay and uh, one over at, um, at Sandy Hook as well. You can take a boat ride around the Inner Harbor, and these are some of the things that Terry was talking about a minute ago. Our national park tour run by our Conservancy, Gateway to America, one of our audio tours, talks about all of the national parks of New York Harbor, but it does it from the water, which makes it one-stop shopping and easy for visitors. And you can follow in the footsteps of immigrants who created our diverse population that, is, that characterizes our nation even today by visiting Ellis Island, Castle Clinton, the Tenement Museum, and other sites that are around the city. Um, these sites together, taken as a whole, 22 recognizable destinations host over 17 million visitors a year and they provide a huge economic benefit to the harbor. Terry was talking about that as well. We estimate that, that uh, um, uh, kind of rotating built up benefit to be hundreds of millions of dollars. Visitors to our sites take tours, ride boats, they swim at ocean beaches, they bike on greenways, they explore forts and historic homes. They attend concerts, they conduct bio blitzes. Yes, in New York City, they ride horses. They see the films or exhibits at the various visitor centers we have at our sites. They can purchase a picnic lunch or they can dine overlooking the sea. They can paddle kayaks, they can bird watch. The list goes on and on. And these are all publicly owned and publicly operated facilities, many, many of them free, or char free of charge. Our single biggest challenge is evident from, you know, you can just look at the map and see the problem. We're spread out all over the place. You know, we run all the way down into New Jersey and way up into Westchester County. People don't know that we're there. Terry mentioned that folks will plan the sites that they want to visit and then worry about their transportation and their lodging. Uh, we're not even on the radar screen. We're outshouted by Broadway. We're outshouted by um, the top of the rock, um, even the newer site, the World Trade Center Memorial, folks don't really recognize that we're around. And transportation to get to our sites, frankly, is often complex. Now, New Yorkers are comfortable with the subway, visitors from out of town. Frankly, if it's a simple ride from a midtown hotel down to the battery, they're going to be okay. But if they've got to can think about changing, ca catching a bus, and then switching to another subway or whatever to get out. Even, even local residents, the wilds of Brooklyn and Queens are, are pretty daunting. And, you know, getting to Staten Island, whew, I mean, most folks don't even realize that it's part of the neighborhood. So, and, you know, to top it off, um, even though water transportation is wonderful and my favorite way of getting around, for many folks, the cost is sometimes prohibitive. Where we have had successes, <clears throat> We've tried to take advantage of the sites that we have that are right on the water. And in the places where that has occurred has been because we have been able to link landside transportation, make the connections, and make the connections transparent, accessible, and attractive so that it's easy to find your way around, easy to get there. Part of the reason that our waterborne tours that go around the Inner Harbor are so successful is because there's easy access from Manhattan. You just simply get on a ferry down at the Battery. And, um, you know, the, the docks vary from year to year, but they're always down at the battery. The same thing with the Statue of Liberty. You know, I'm sure people would find her no matter what. But when we've talked about con con considering moving our security screening facility over to New Jersey, I mean, people were horrified at the prospect that the public, including yourself, myself, the public would have to get across over somehow to New Jersey and find their way to us. Nearly impossible. We have a number of successful routes now on the water, and again, these are possible because of landside and waterside connections. You get on a boat at, in the, at the lower end of Manhattan, and you can take a ferry out to the beaches at Sandy Hook. Extremely popular run. A few years ago, we experimented with the city running a, a summer shuttle out to Reese Landing so that people could visit the, the beaches at Reese, Rockaway, the, along the Rockaway Peninsula there, Fort Tilden Beach and, um, and Reese Beach at the bathhouse, and um, that was so successful that a private operator actually um, decided to take it up. It turns out that it's economically viable. Obviously, the Statue of Liberty connections there are, are so easy to use. 
Uh, and we're working on building those connections for the future. So right now we're working to finish with uh, the um, with a variety of neighborhood and community organizations in the Regional Plan Association, the greenway that goes around Jamaica Bay, bike uh, and pedestrian connections. We're looking with the city parks about a connection along the south shore um, of Staten Island, and we're looking at a joint planning arrangement with the city parks around Jamaica Bay. It, it doesn't really show on the map, but these areas in here are all city park land right on the other side of the Belt Parkway. We're talking about knitting those back together with a coordinated set of programs facilities and promotion to help Jamaica Bay become more attractive and more accessible. One of the big challenges, of course, is getting there. So we're working with the City Department of Transportation to talk about what might be important there. We really feel that, that connecting, that th there is a, a tremendous amount of opportunity along the waterfront. I've only mentioned our sites, but there are literally dozens of other sites that are managed by others that are on or near the waterfront and that make terrific packages. If you think about the themes that I mentioned, the theme of the, the creation of our diverse population, the defenses of New York Harbor and how they've evolved, um, the creation of our early government and some of its early heroes, those are all um, books, if you will, and if you visit just one of our sites or one of the sites managed by others, you've read a page of the book. If you want to read the whole book, you've got to move around the landscape. We don't make that easy. So we're, we're looking for ways to create those linkages. We're excited about the possibilities. A couple of years ago, there was some discussion about creating a harbor district in the inner harbor. That was a first step. It didn't get very far, but I'm hoping it planted a seed. So we're optimistic, looking forward, and ready to be a part of it. Our next speaker is Chris O'Brien, who is an executive director of OpSail. Um, again, he's, he starts off with how he's a lifelong sailor, and, and this is the type of person that I'm talking about who we're looking to, to really support in the harbor, the individuals who are taking an initiative and creating their own destinations. Um, just a quick plug for New York Water Taxi, you're able to buy tickets on for May 22nd to be able to see the vessels. Um, we've been working with uh, John Doswell's group, Working Harbor Group, so you'll also have a very well-educated person to be talking about each of the vessels you see. So please visit our booth in the back, and um, I'm going to move it on to Chris. Good morning, everybody. Uh, Roland asked me to come here and join this panel today to talk a little bit about the things that we can do uh, in New York Harbor when we talk about uh, creating world-class events. Uh, Opsail uh, enjoys these big events in New York Harbor only if the resources exist within the harbor for us to, to utilize. Uh, and here it is. Uh, this is a world-class picture of a world-class harbor and a world-class event. Wow. This is Opsail 86. I know my friends in the Coast Guard cringe a little bit when they look at this. <laughs> You know, uh, more than 30,000 spectator boats uh, welcoming the international tall ships from around the world uh, coming into New York Harbor. Uh, this, is, this is tremendous. This, this image really speaks for itself. These things have happened in New York and can happen in New York. Uh, I'll get to in a minute a little bit about the, the positives, the economic engine, and, and, and how uh, this, these events affect the city in a positive way, but these events can happen. Uh, Opsail, a long partner with the U.S. Navy, uh, makes these events happen, uh, and in partnership with, with New York City. We've got uh, ships lined up, or starting to line up now. They're coming in on the 23rd as part of Fleet Week. So the Opsail tall ships, we're going to be participating in Fleet Week this year. We'll talk a little bit about that, too. Uh, how, how does this type of event or organization come together? Uh, it takes support at a very high level. Uh, you see here uh, President Kennedy, one of our uh, patrons at the very beginning uh, when the organization was founded. Some of you may recognize Frank Brainerd with the glasses in the background there, a, a lifelong maritime uh, enthusiast and supporter of New York and trying to create ways to bring people down to the water and engage people uh, with the water in our maritime heritage. Uh, so back there in 1961, uh, the groundwork was laid for Opsail to go around the world uh, and recruit these tall ships uh, to come to New York. And they did. Uh, they came uh, for the first time for the 1964 World Fair. Uh, 
The idea was that these tall ships are disappearing off the face of the earth. This may be the last time we're able to gather these ships, something that hadn't been seen in a generation in New York Harbor, really uh, uh, the heritage of New York Harbor. New York was built on the back of ships just like this. So they came. And what we learned was that we instantly created a New York tradition. Uh, and not only the ships came, but the people came. <laughs> I'm going to go back. So these ships have this unique and amazing uh, uh, way of bringing people down to the waterfront. Uh, the, the spectacle of them, the intrigue, it's, it's, it's really sometimes hard to put your arms around it until you see it, but I'm sure anyone in this room ha who has witnessed an Opsail event knows where they were when, when those ships came in. You go back and you think about it. I, I hear the stories all the time. I remember when I was a kid and I watched as the ships came in for Opsail 76 or Opsail 86 or another time. Uh, Opsail does these events uh, not only in New York, but we're, we work with other port cities too. So the stories are the same in Baltimore and in Boston and Norfolk. Uh, we just, just as our current series, uh, for, uh, for this year with the Navy, we just wrapped up an event in New Orleans, a tremendous success, the first time the tall ships have been to New Orleans down to the waterfront like this, and it really was a, just a tremendous success. Uh, these, these events bring people out en masse, and it's cut off, unfortunately, in this, but that Daily News cover, uh, cover story, six million view operation sale. So uh, people get excited about these things. These events, well, an, an event like this is such a tremendous way to bring people down, engage them in the waterfront, show off the waterfront. A city like New York has got a lot to show off. The work that's been done and is being done by so many in New York to revitalize, to rebuild, uh, this is how we show it off. Uh, and not only do the people come, but the money comes. Uh, here is a New York Convention Visitors Bureau letter. Uh, you may not be able to read it, so I'm going to cut to the chase here. Uh, NYC, the predecessor here to NYC and company estimated that in 86, uh, the total positive economic impact from Opsail was $500 million. Uh, that's, that's a pretty good number. Uh, and, you know, it's, it's interesting because this number was achieved for a week-long event. This is one week in New York Harbor over July 4th, 1986. Uh, so these types of events layered on the existing and ongoing efforts in New York Harbor uh, really kind of come together to, to, create, a, to create a whole package. Uh, they take, these events take support at many levels. Uh, they take uh, time and effort and resources. Uh, we've been Really, really very lucky uh, to be working with the Navy and with the mayor's office this year to create what, uh, what uh, the, the Fleet Week event, which is basically going to be a supersized Fleet Week, including the Opsail Tall Ships, uh, the Coast Guard, the, the EDC, uh, you name it, all of the parties, the NYPD coming together uh, to work on these events. Uh, so the ships are coming back. I fully expect everyone in this room to be down there on the water May 23rd as the ships come in. They're going to be going under the, under the Verrazano at 8.11. And am I still correct at 8.11? Time changes a little bit. But uh, they're going to be sailing up the river, up the Hudson, turning at the George Washington Bridge. They're going to be reviewing uh, at noon in front of the Intrepid. Then they're going to be going to three boroughs. Uh, we're going to have tall ships in Manhattan, Brooklyn, and Staten Island. They'll be open. They're free to the public. This is, another, this is another amazing thing about these events. Open and free to the public. We're not only engaging the residents, the New Yorkers, uh, and, and folks from the, from the near outlying uh, areas, but for, for tourists, a free event like this is just tremendous. So I'm going to leave it on this slide here. Uh, but uh, again, I expect everyone in this room to be down there. Watch the ships come in. Take your families out. Go see the ships. See this firsthand. Uh, these sorts of things can happen in New York, and they do, and they are next week. Thank you.
Again, I can't encourage everybody enough to be able to try to take a ship out to see to see these tall ships. It's the best way to get close up to them. And I can I was an intern at the Hudson River Park Trust when Opsail was here last and even though it's free, it's not very pleasant to be stuck in a crowd. Um, so our next speaker, I know a little bit more from my, my real estate experience. Um, she's from the New York uh, State of, on um, sorry New York State Council on the Arts. Um, Lisa Robb, Executive Director, and I think what Lisa's here to talk about is how how arts and culture really is an impetus for economic development. Um, many of us were here during when we had the Waterfalls exhibition, and it was huge. Everybody from um, my competitors to the small boat industry, including the kayakers, were going out to see these waterfalls. And I, we want to talk to Lisa a little bit about how can we be improving um, what we're doing on the waterfront as far as exhibits. But then also she has experience, I believe, in San Francisco as well, as how we can be looking at what our signage is doing. What are we doing to communicate to people visiting to New York and to be talking about how talking about the waterfront and getting the culture, all of these great historical cultural importance that we've just been talking about, how can we be communicating that message to, to our community? Well, we don't have a PowerPoint because we're here to raise friends. And as we know, before you can raise funds or raise awareness, you have to raise friends. We really thank Roland for thinking of the New York State Council on the Arts as someone that had valuable and relevant contributions to make to a conference like this. On behalf of Governor Cuomo and the legislature, we thank you for inviting us. I'll tell you a little bit about the Arts Council, and then I'll talk about some of the ways in which the work we do faces very well to the incredible venue opportunities that the waterfront allows us throughout the whole entire metropolitan region. The Arts Council, like the New York Mets, was created in 1962. We are 50 years old this year. Uh, Governor Rockefeller created the Arts Council. It was the first public uh, funding for state arts in the nation. And three years later, the NEA modeled themselves on the Arts Council of New York and became a statutorily created federal agency. Right now, the agency's work, uh, we distribute $31.6 million to 1,400 organizations in the form of 2,100 grants. We also redistribute about $6 million through 80 organizations to another 1,000 organizations and 800 artists. We actually, in scope, are the largest public-private partnership in New York State government with 100% of our work done in partnership with private business. For the most part, it's partnership with not-for-profit entities, but we also work with municipal and federal government. And in fact, I will talk about one of the partnerships that started through the quadricentennial celebration of the Hudson River with the National Heritage Corridors, part of the National Park System. Um, an exciting development happened this year for us in terms of economic vitality. Uh, water and waterside activities have a much easier time making a, ca a case for economic, uh, being an economic driver, an economic growth engine. Um, this has been a much more tricky journey for the arts, partly because so much of our value is intrinsic. How much is a smile worth? You know, it varies in terms of who you're talking to. But we've, we've had a lot of luck beginning to peg metrics of public participation and public do uh, I'm sorry, private dollars spent on, on arts-related activities. We think of the harbor side, the river side, the creek sides, the ocean sides around metropolitan New York as well as the rest of the states as fantastic venues for arts, culture, heritage, and edu educational activities. Right now, um, Department of Cultural Affairs, I know, from New York City was very pleased to be brought to the table with the uh, report, with the projects that the um, deputy commissioner, I guess, was talking about for New York City. And I know that New York State is looking forward to beginning to be a partner to sites and other not-for-profit organizations and government agencies doing this work. I come out of community arts, and we have long ago, we don't leave any rock unturned in terms of who we can partner with. And I'm proud to say that in the Bronx, the Point, as well as the Bronx River Arts Center, both do programming related to environmental and cultural education on water, in waterside uh, venues. Our own work right now with a waterside venue is the uh, National Heritage Corridor um, of the Erie Canal and Hudson 
region. Uh, we're working right now with a grant with that organization that was funded by Disney Corporation to the National Parks Foundation to bring primarily Title I school children uh, in buses into these various sites. And we're hoping to put, we are actually partnering on that grant with them related to uh, the celebration of the Erie Canal uh, and the requirement in fourth and fifth grade for all New York students to learn about that tremendous waterway um, in New York State. One of the, I think one of the challenges for arts and culture has been to move to more of a public participation model and I think that Waterfront is a wonderful partner for us as a venue as well as organizationally because the water is is a more easily understood magnet for people. The boats, I wanted him to leave that, um, that slide up because that slide could just as easily have been a 19th century painting uh, and, and that is the, the power of the water to relax, to provide respite, curiosity, uh, that, that great expanse, that reflection. We know that it's an incredible magnet and we hope that more arts and culture organizations look to the waterfront and partnering with organizations as, as a site for at any kind of activity. We've got, you know, there are literary activities, there is heritage and folk art activities, there are concerts, film presentations, tremendous uh, exhibition opportunities with museums and other uh, venues that show art nearby. Um, in closing, I want to talk about an opportunity related to the Regional Economic Development Council. Uh, in, last year, the governor announced a new way to distribute public monies that had more of a regional priority overlay as opposed to a legislature overlay. And using 10, 10 regions of the state, of which New York City is one, the five boroughs, um, uh, about $750 million was made available for government entities, private entities, business entities, not-for-profit not entities to come in working with their regional councils to come up with economically viable programs. Last year, the art, there were many art applications, cultural applications, as well as agriculture and market applications, yet no funding had been available to us to participate. We appreciate the governor and legislature's enlightened stance in looking at what happened last year and this year allocating $4 million for, to the Arts Council as well as to Ags and Markets, the Department of State Coastal, um, uh, Coastal Communities, Parks and Rec. They were in it last year, but three agencies are new. This is a, a tremendous opportunity for a coalition of waterfront-oriented organizations to come together to ask for funding through the New York City Regional Council for a comprehensive arts heritage related grants to come in. I know that we, the Metropolitan Water Alliance has their eco docks which might be available for this. I know that on Governor's Island we certainly have a robust arts and culture activities that take place throughout the warm weather seasons. But we see, when we see the kind of convening and the cross-pollination and the cross-section that's at this type of waterfront conference, we, we would encourage all of you to visit newyorkworks.newyork.gov to see what the Regional Economic Development Councils may offer your organizations, not just related to our arts and culture funding, but the other 12 agencies that have funds in that catchment. Uh, that, the, that application is open now and closes in the middle of July and those funds are awarded in the fall of 12 and uh, depending on the agency there are up to five years of implementation timelines depending on which uh, catchment of money you're applying for. So again I thank you very much for having us and hope that the next time someone, myself or someone from our agency comes, we will have a fantastic PowerPoint with many dots, with many activities going on throughout the New York waterfront area. Thank you very much. Um, to start, I, I wanted to ask the panel uh, just a few questions about communication. I think it's um, New York Harbor has so many opportunities. There's so much out there to discuss. 
And we have about a million passengers per year. We spend a lot of New York water taxi and Circle Line downtown, spends a lot of time with nonprofit organizations like Working Harbor as well as Audubon um, in communicating what is out there, what is the exciting things that we can be working with. I know that, that Terry's group, no, I'm sorry, City Sites is now working with um, also the National Harbor Conservancy in, in promoting and, and having a discussion as to what that is. All of our tour guides are, are making sure that we're talking about that. How do you think the best way to communicate to, to passengers and also visitors to New York about the New York Harbor is? I, I think first of all, it's uh, in my view, it's critical that NYC Inc. and the other tourism promotion organization, the DMOs, all recognize the huge resource that New York Harbor is um, I think, for instance, if you do a listing in one of their guides, uh, you're, you're going to find the boat businesses are under sightseeing and not under boat businesses. So sometimes you're, you feel like you're competing with uh, land-based venues. So I think to the extent people can understand that it's a, a separate and amazing resource and gets promoted that way, uh, it's going to be uh, more valuable. And then I think the other critical element is the Internet. Obviously, uh, we're an Internet-centric world now. and. Um, uh, uh, again, getting to travelers before they make their plans, uh, the, 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 the single most uh, efficient way to do that is through um, internet websites, which is frequently collaboration, um, you know, with like our National Park Service partners, um, you know, with OpSail. I mean, those are all things where you need to uh, find that type of collaboration to improve the ability to co communicate uh, cost effectively and efficiently. So that would be my thought about it. Um, okay, another, does anybody have anything else to answer to that? Well, I, you know, I wanted to apologize for not talking about wayfinding, which you had mentioned. I do think that if we could do a better job uh, integrating wayfinding and signage on the social media platform level, as well as on the streetscape and intermodal transit centers that relates what used to be fairly bunkerized um, private sector, public sector, government sector, cultural sector, education sector, recreation sector, if we could do a better job of having a more holistic ecology about these amenities and have our signage reflect that, I think it would be of tremendous use to the uh, public. Um, another question, as we're building these destinations, um, just quickly reflecting on, on recent history, the 9-11 Memorial has been a huge success and it's been a huge draw for New York, New York residents as well as New York tourists, but going downtown can be very tricky as on, la on land transportation. Um, the ferry industry has come together to help transport over 100,000 passengers down, down to that area. In, in what ways could we be looking, even just broadening the aspect, even the Statue of Liberty or even Ellis Island, how can the ferry industry be promoting um, intermodal or waterborne transportation? Well, I certainly have an opinion about that. <laughs> um, I mean, I think for starters, uh, the ferry system at some point uh, needs to become part of the transportation system. Instead of an accessory, um, mm -hmm. you know, the, the trains and the buses uh, and airports, uh, they suck up huge amounts of money. I mean that in a good way. Um, but from a practical standpoint, uh, the boats and the ferry systems are merely a rounding error. I mean, we make massive and enormous news if we get a small subsidy for, a, for an amazing East River type ferry system when it should be uh, automatic and easy. And, and frankly, uh, you know, the, the whole system should be uh, uh, thought of as part of the overall transportation system. Uh, small dollars uh, that are that are maybe not used efficiency in other places, if put into the ferry industry, would expand it dramatically uh, to the benefit of, of, of really uh, both residents and the tourists alike. Why isn't it though? Why isn't the why, why isn't, isn't the ferry system? And the first slide that I put up there, the challenge was public policy. I don't think the uh, I mean I think it's easy for people to say, oh well, ferries only a few people ride those, therefore not we true. will not support those. And th and that's frequently mm -hmm. what happens. And then usually the next thing that happens is. Uh, the tunnel is closed or, uh, you know, there's a strike or something like that and the ferries show up and help 
everybody, you know, uh, exists. So. And it, is it true that very few people ride the ferries? That's not true. Isn't that correct? If you count, if you count ridership on a daily basis, yes. ferry ridership is very small compared to, let's say, train ridership. Okay. Um, there's no doubt about that, but par that's partly because the chicken and the egg. Uh, I mean, you only have uh, so many places where ferries can operate. Uh, there's a, a, an interest in adding more facilities, obviously, but uh, do any of those facilities easily connect with uh, subways and become intermodal? Uh, I mean, just a, this simple example, if you had the uh, uh, Crosstown subway, uh, the, you know, the, the shuttle from Grand Central to Times Square, if that extended clear to the Hudson River, Mm -hmm. you would probably have five times more people riding the ferries, ten times more people, mm -hmm. just something as basic as that, mm -hmm. at least in my view. And mm -hmm. this, I mean, er, you know, everybody has a different perspective about it, but to me that's the single thing that would, would make ferry ridership come alive. And look, you do not need eminent domain to get a new ferry route. Compared to the capital of buying, a, you know, a train and the running the electrical wires and building the tunnels and all that, uh, ferries can be added so easily and so distributed and so uh, appropriate to where their needs are. And I, just to add to Terry's comment, it's not the ferries that are hard to add, but it's the it's the additional components around it. It's the amenities. It's the and it's being able to be able to dock. That's where the largest capital costs are. So I think in adding additional ferry routes, what what we need to be examining are how can the, how can the city or the government be helping out with the capital cost of impl implementing new docks, and including in that implementing the, the, the fare ridership that we need to make it easy to transfer from a ferry to the MTA subway. Um, just, I can simply say that just trying to provide docks for the series of audio tours that we have is very, very difficult. There just isn't enough in infrastructure. And then some of those docks are located in places where visitors cannot easily get to them. We've mm -hmm. looked hard at, at places that are up the Hudson River and up the East River, and truthfully, they're really separated by waterfront development that separates um, public centers of Manhattan from easy access to the waterfront. If you look at the public transportation system, which our visitors try to navigate by the thousands every day, most of it is organized about getting commuters from the outer boroughs into and out of Manhattan to go to work. That's really the way that system was set up. And when you look at trying to take those um, subway and bus connections and make them work for waterfront destinations, you, 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 run, out of, you run out of subway, you run out of bus, um, and, and trying to figure out how to turn the public checkbook toward reconsidering the investment made in getting visitors to the waterfront is absolutely, absolutely critical. I would just add one more comment. I think the two most recognized names in the ferry business in the area, water, Waterways and Water Taxi, both of them, frankly, have a real estate genesis uh, to start and to motivate and to uh, perpetuate them, uh, not a transportation genesis. And to me, if, if that dynamic uh, doesn't change, those will continue to be cyclical and, and not a part of mainstream transportation as they should be. Um, Chris, I have a question for you from the audience. How would you approach, and of course anybody else, how would you approach the introduction of, of large historic ships as a stationary attraction in New York City? And if you're so brave, you may want to mention South Street Seaport since we, we have that destination. Well, it, it, it kind of goes back to some of this conversation here. It's a first, first and foremost, foremost is the infrastructure there to be able to receive uh, historic vessels. Uh, in a way that allows people to get to them uh, and that is safe uh, for navigational purposes for the vessels to come and go. That, uh, you know, that's, that really has been the biggest challenge that we've had here working with the city, uh, bringing these tall ships in uh, for, the, for this event. And, it's, and it's, it's been a challenge all along, but it's getting harder and harder as we see more of the pier space either be reallocated for different purposes or you know, fall into disrepair or just be unusable and there's silting and there are other issues too. Uh, but, but I think, number one, it's making that space available for historic vessels uh, to visit. And you know, should that be uh, real estate that is owned and maintained by the city or a government organization, it probably should be. Uh, you know, the cost commercially to maintain a space like that or you know, there could be partnerships developed also. Uh, with some commercial interests. Uh, currently, uh, if a tall ship or a historic vessel wants to come in there, they have very limited choices, and the choices they do have probably involve uh, a considerable amount of money 
uh, t for birthing fees, et cetera. Um, Lisa, if you're an artist with uh, waterfront interest and, and waterfront work, how would you recommend seeking partnerships and funding to implement your project and vision on the waterfront? Well, I'm, I'm pleased to say that uh, the New York State Council on the Arts does still fund uh, through the five arts councils, one in each borough. They are, I spoke earlier of our regranting opportunities where to bring uh, local arts and cultural priorities to the fore, we regrant money out. So, for instance, each of the boroughs has an arts council, and there is regrant state money that is sent to them. And one of the things that they support is the work of individual artists. As well, uh, the New York Foundation for the Arts administers uh, a, about an $800,000 grant from us to provide a $7,000. Uh, grants to artists not for specific work but to just support them for a period of time so they can do work take or take a break uh, but do work that's meaningful to them Th those are the things I think of immediately support for individual I, I would also say to go to Kickstarter and the other types of online opportunities that now exist where uh, you know people can go in with various ideas and Art, Art Spire is another one that NYFA, N-Y-F-A dot O-R-G offers, where artists can put their ideas up online and generate private contributions to support their ideas. Um, this is a question for the entire p panel, but how do we overcome the perception that anything to do with water or boats is only a luxury and not to be part of everyday life? Well... <clears throat> We're actually starting something fairly um, experimental this summer with NYC and company on their website. We're looking at promoting Jamaica Bay and the kinds of programs and activities that you can spend a day there or half a day there if you like to bike, if you like to fish, if you like to swim. Um, we're creating a package of, um, of a kind of images and a, a teaser list of activities on their website that is specifically site-specific and focused that says, you know, consider a day at Jamaica Bay. And, and the, the point of it is to experiment with how bundling opportunities and making them look accessible, desirable, and um, frankly fun for an afternoon for an ordinary person, something that doesn't cost a lot of money, something that anyone might enjoy doing, to experiment with seeing how packaging those differently and marketing them differently might engage audiences differently. We struggle to get people to Jamaica Bay except for those who live in the immediate vicinity because they don't really know what to do there. So I think one of the strategies is to get, is to think about how we can bundle and package and then make visible to folks through um, at portals that they're accustomed to using, accustomed to going to, to look for for information. Um, uh, experiences that are described in ways that are very accessible just to you know, regular folks who live here. We're going to see how that works. And in our experience at New York Water Taxi, we, again, we've been working with uh, Audubon and, and Working Harbor Group, and I think it's about finding people's specific interests and tuning them into their specific interests and making them realize um, what, what opportunities are out, out in the harbor. Um, I, ha I have a question about the Lighthouse Museum that I'm just going to paraphrase a little bit. The Lighthouse Museum is out in Staten Island, of course, and lighthouse, lighthouses um, in general in, in the harbor, and especially in New York Harbor, have a great history. Um, how, how do you suggest just to the panel that we, we inform the public better about the Lighthouse Museum, knowing it's out in Staten Island, which is a little bit far away for, for our boats to go out there, and then also creating a single, um, a single route? Well, there's a free ferry that takes you right over to Staten Island. Oh, <laughs> you don't mention that ferry. No. <laughs> I mean, the, the problem is um, folks aren't necessarily aware. Um, I have been to the Lighthouse Museum, and, you know, to do it, you've, you've got to kind of, you've got to have to find your way. I mean, this goes back, I think, to the point of accepting responsibility jointly for saying, you know, we really have not pooled our information resources here. Um, to make these sites really accessible and for people to feel, oh, I could do that. Oh, that's out there, but oh, I see how to get there. I could do that. We don't package it like that. Um, there, there is a summer shuttle that runs uh, from the Staten Island Ferry out to our site at Fort Wadsworth and in other places along the waterfront. But other than that, you pretty well have to find your own way. So I think I'm going to go back to the wayfinding comment. I think that was absolutely powerful, very, very important wayfinding 
on websites through the internet, but also wayfinding on site. I'm going to combine. I'm going to try to combine two questions in the effort of time. But fast forward ten years, what major changes do you expect from water for the waterfront sightseeing, cruises, and entertainment? And how can we be looking at other cities to be improving what we'll be doing in ten years? Well, we can definitely look to the West Coast. I must say, one of the I lived on the West Coast for ten years, and I did realize then in, in a stunning way that the fact that so much of our coastline is closed because it's allowed to be privatized, it's not considered a public amenity, has created a tremendous barrier and a, and a feeling of elitism about access to it. So I do think if we look to uh, the West Coast, to the city certainly on the West Coast, you just see unbelievably vibrant cultural heritage, education, boating, and, and part of that is because there ha it is not a private, it, it, it's a public coastline. So I do think that will continue to be a tremendous uh, challenge. But I, I do think that as we listen to the um, like General Boulay, Mr. Boulay, okay. soon to be Mr. Colonel, <laughs> Colonel Boulay, um, and, and to hear it coming from someone in the you know, high echelons of the federal government about the power of public-private partnership. I wish that when we had art convenings, we had the variety of economic, private sector, public sector, government sector, nonprofit sectors that I see assembled here today. We, we, I envy you. And I do think there's a tremendous opportunity to pull that together with some kind of a comprehensive awareness-raising marketing campaign. I would add two or three things. First of all, I think uh, on the 10-year on the crystal ball, I think, number one, you're going to find more environmentally friendly vessels. Number mm -hmm. two, I think you're going to see consolidation in the industry. I think you'll find bigger players and still small entrepreneurial players, but maybe fewer middle-sized players. I think the middle guys will, will grow up and more small guys will come in. I think there'll be more public-private partnerships for berthing and um, uh, boats and boat financing and new products like that. Um, I think operations will be more integrated. Instead of simply having a sightseeing business and a ferry operation, uh, you'll find more integration of those to make people more efficient. I do think you'll see some amazing new products and services, some that are offered in other locations, some that will be just New York-centric. Uh, and I also think that the icons like the Statue of Liberty and 9-11 uh, and things like that will continue to be even more and more a popular and will drive more and more visitation uh, to the area. And really, those are the anchor tenants uh, uh, in the mall of, of the New York Waterway, so to speak. So to me, uh, you want those things to be really healthy and active and then use those to help those things around it prosper. Go ahead. I don't want to, I don't want to be a downer, but I, I see uh, greater challenges in the future for the historic vessel visits and the in the other sorts of things that, uh, you know, like the tall ships coming in for upsail or, or other activities like that, I see I see that continuing to be a greater challenge, uh, uh, you know, as kind of as we've been talking here today. Uh, so, uh, I would I would hope that you know the public-private partnerships uh, and other partnerships could be developed to focus on that uh, that aspect of uh, of bringing bringing people and vessels in. Um, this is this is for Maria, which I'm I'm paraphrasing a little bit. But what has your experience been with city sites and Gray Line now that they're running the National Harbor Conservancy tour? Well, this gets to the question of ease, accessibility, and bundling, and the fact that visitors to New York, I I think, often find planning a visit somewhat overwhelming, and so they tend to go to the to through to a route that is simple and packaged. We've had much better results with that tour since the promotion of it was bundled with city sites. Um, our ridership has gone way up. I think we were serving, I want to say in the last five years, we've served some 400,000 visitors on that tour. So it's, it's, and it's a, you know, a modest little offering hidden among all the thousands of other harbor tour offerings around. So the bundling, and that has gone up just in the last couple of years because of that. Um, people, I, I think in New York, where there, there are so many choices, and I think especially folks from out of town find the whole thing kind of daunting and big, that packaging and, and bundling um, are successful and important tools to use. Um, why doesn't the Fed and state governments subsidize ferries as, as they do uh, road and, and rail? 
I'm not sure I can answer that perfectly. They're, they're certainly uh, doing some subsidies of facilities. There's, uh, you know, transportation grants uh, regularly, uh, some that are earmarked, uh, you know, New Jersey, Alaska, Washington have all been successful in getting fairly good grants there. Um, I think it's not mainstream, and, and I think that, uh, again, there's, uh, they go where the, the votes are, and uh, the votes are on land. They're not on the water right now. Um, I, I, I don't think that that's uh, going to be that way forever necessarily, but um, clearly there has not been a, uh, you know, a federal transportation policy that favored waterways. Um, yet, again, here in New York, without them, um, you know, the, the, there's certain people that wholly depend on, on great waterway transportation to uh, be able to work and play and do the things that they do. Um, what has New York, City, New York State Council on, on the Arts done to support historic ships or um, the harbor in the past? Yeah. Um, New York Harbor would be a new partner. I can speak to the Vessels as Venues activity that we did related to the quadricentennial of the Hudson River. And we used, is, do you know if it's the Quackenbush? I, I don't know the name. of. We used a vessel as a venue for different uh, arts and cultural heritage activities. Right now, if there, there may be organizations that we fund, but I must say the, the waterfront as a venue and waterfront agencies or not-for-profits as partners is a tremendous opportunity for us because it, it is not a deeply developed partnership. Like, I was curious with the bundling. So with your Lower Manhattan bundling, do you bundle in visiting like the Smithsonian's Museum of the American Indian? Because it's just, I say that because I was thinking, oh, it's adjacent. I should tell John Howard. I wonder if he knows he could bundle in something. Um, we, we don't do the bundling. City, City Sites is doing the bundling right. for us. But what we found was that when our tickets are marketed side by side with other opportunities and can be sold as a package that people tend to buy the package. Right. So, uh, but I, I think the American Indian Museum is open free of charge. I don't think you, I don't think you need to, well, to get it, in there. But which is okay too. Yeah, that's but, okay too. I mean, that could be listed as one of the sites in the bundle. Right. So yeah. I mean, I think again, we there's a, just a significant opportunity to for the arts to expand where we think of ourselves as recreational. Uh, respite, relaxation activities, and again, like water, move away from potentially an elitist, you know, the arts are for the people, the arts aren't for a few, and the arts aren't just for art's sake. The arts are for everybody. And so that's just like the water, which I believe some of us believe we crawled out of. So it should, it should be a happy marriage. <laughs> Um, beyond the bundling with uh, double-decker buses or, you know, how can we be better bundling with MTA and also New York, Manhattan especially is an extremely walkable city and now we also have bike share. How can we be promoting other ways to get around town beyond um, land board transportation because it has all these negative effects as far as congestion and, and that seems to be the, the way of Plan NYC and, and the mayor's initiative? Well, we have, first of all, we have to put our heads together. Um, and, and all of the transportation providers and service providers need to kind of pool their information. A few years ago, we had a brilliant idea to do a joint traveler's information system, which would, be, it would have been an on, on online um, website for planning your visit that would have been free of administrative boundaries or, uh, or management constraints. Simply, how do you get from point A to point B if you want to visit these five other sites? And we were focusing that around the Harbor District, which never came to fruition. Ironically, it took us so long, the Park Service, so long to get the funding to get the thing um, designed and set up that technology had moved past us and now everybody's using apps. So now we're looking at apps. But I, I think the key is that many of us have done our promotion, our planning, our wayfinding, and our information about transportation and programs independently of each other. Mm -hmm. And that's one of the reasons that we're experimenting with um, NYC and company this summer to promote jointly city and national park and private um, or, um, activities around Jamaica Bay to see whether or not joint promotion and information about how to get to and from and how much it costs and what you can do makes a difference. We, we think it will. We'll see. If, if I could just add, you know, and this is a kind of a real-time story, the, the partnership between Opsail and New York Water Taxi has been great, but when we, when we were thinking about this, we, we didn't really have a resource that we felt we could go to that could help us put together a comprehensive transportation plan to visit all the boroughs and see all the all the amazing sites there that we're going to be seeing so we kind of developed a one-off uh, partnership with New York water taxi to do that 
Uh, so uh, having, having uh, a team or a resource that, that uh, is closely linked with everyone and they know who to plug into and how to do it to create opportunities, I think, is a, is a great challenge to have. I can add to that as well. If you, one of our great partners is uh, CityPass, and uh, it's a company that uh, bundles attractions. And bundling, to a certain extent, is really marketing and selling in an efficient way. You kind of let's let's make sure we know what that bundling really is all about. Uh, the first city that they went active in was San Francisco, and the first product that they put in there was a Muni Pass that included a cable car ride and three days anywhere you wanted to go in the Muni was there. And the next thing they did is add attractions that you could reach by Muni. So you could come to San Francisco and have uh, you know, two or three days of activities with simply a city pass. Uh, that efficiency of uh, collaboration and working together and uh, the whole uh, question about uh, am I going to be in Queens or the Bronx or whatever, if you have your pass and it's completely inclusive, everything you need is right there. It's easy to market. It's easy to, to bundle. Uh, everybody understands how it works. Um, to me, that's the, the single greatest thing that could be done to ensure um, long-term long, long -term success, and uh, uh, we always find that City Pass, uh, a lot of locals buy it for their friends when they come to town also. It's, 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 a, it's a magical product. Thank you. Um, I, this is just of personal interest. How do you think we can in, be increase, increasing the amount of day trips that we are, can be providing on the ferry? So going out to Sandy Hook or going up to um, West Point are, are wonderful opportunities for a day trip that obviously has a great way to get up there by via waterborne transportation. What are the what are the things that this panel could think of as far as increasing the the ability for day trips? Well, I spoke last week at Arts on the Hudson. I could um, um, the Mid Hudson Valley has done a tremendous uh, work with their um, integrating arts, culture, industry. Uh, water activities along the Hudson, and when I, I'm talk, sort of talking peak skill to Newburgh, say, they opened a, a nine-year-old um, activity, Arts on the Hudson, which now serves 20 communities, the majority of them on the water, uh, with participation by over a thousand artists. It's over two different weekends. So again, almost like a water pass, um, if there was a way that upstate cultural, recreational, educational activities could partner with waterborne, you know, transportation, that, that would be great. There used to be a ferry, someone was saying, that went between, I don't know how far up the Hudson it went, but it came from New York and went up, I think it was even a water wheel boat, in fact. If there was anywhere in New York City or New York Harbor, there was a ferry. Yes. That's the history of ferries right. in New York Harbor right. is, is amazing, and there really was a ferry almost everywhere right. um, throughout the New York. You can say someplace right. in the history there was a ferry, right. but unfortunately due to landborne transportation and the popularity of rail and, and cars, a lot of the ferry industries have died. Um, uh, the last question, I think, which is really important in getting into the what this, this panel has been about and, and what, are, what are the commercial efforts that are being looked at to draw people to the waterfront? Do you guys have any thoughts? Uh... Well, certainly uh, capital investment in facilities and boats is a, is, a, is a commercial effort, I would say, and the marketing that goes with that. Obviously, uh, um, there's a huge, huge activity, at least with, with our company, to do that. I think uh, there's also, uh, you know, support, sort of a looking back to the last question, there's a, there's a lot of partnerships being formed. In San Francisco, as an example, we have a great partnership with uh, Aquarium on the Bay. Uh, where they've increased their midday kids' activities uh, by combining uh, an aquarium visit with a boat cruise uh, with uh, educational programs. So you can bring, uh, uh, you know, a natural resource educator um, on the boat, a botanist, a biologist, whatever, um, and bring kids in, and, and you can actually get corporate sponsors to underwrite those activities because school districts don't typically have the money. Um, and we're finding, especially in uh, uh, underserved communities, there's a huge opportunity there to uh, do all three of those things, get some commercial benefit, um, work the educational system, and bring corporate sponsors into the, into the fold there. So we hope that there's some opportunity to do that, uh, you know, here in the New York area. You know, uh, some of the big companies certainly could sponsor a class event to, uh, uh, to do one of the historic tours, for instance, that uh, Maria offers, or to go to the statue or whatever. So. To me, it's about partnering and partnerships and, uh, um, you know, having a long-term uh, goal to, uh, to make those things happen. 
So I think throughout the, today's panel, we've heard a lot about how public-private partnerships are really quite essential, and it's really, it's the, the individual like Chris, and I know he's riding off of OPSAIL, but I think it's really the <laughs> dynamicism, dynam how dynamic he has been in, in providing the, that um, mechanism for OPSAIL and pushing it to the public uh, venue in New York City which has a lot of challenges. You know, a lot of around um, the New York Harbor are controlled by different entities. The Hudson River Park Trust controls about six miles. We have uh, Riverside South Park Corporation, which is just north of that Battery Park City Authority, which is actually part of a Hudson River Park Trust. Then just to the south of that, you have the Battery and the Parks Department. On top of that, you have DOT. And so being able to get any type of commercial development has been extremely difficult. There has been several bids at the Hudson River Park level, Hudson River Park Trust, for commercial development, which have honestly failed in the past 10 years. And so New York has been challenging itself in, in our own fights as, as we've been going up against how do we, how do we progress forward in looking at the, the waterfront? How do we look forward in creating a coalition? Because I think what we've heard time and time again is we need to A, be able to find the information in the same location or at least start the habits of individuals who want to go out to the waterfront and finding that information and then also looking to the private industries and ferries, ferry operators to be searching out that information, giving it to them, and then on the other side, the private public partnerships need to be a little bit, need to be much easier in New York City. Again, it's very difficult to be able to develop in, on the commercial waterfront for various reasons in New York City. Thank you.